Good morning. I'm Jim, for those of you that don't know me. And it is such a glorious day, isn't it? Beautiful out there. About a million degrees. And <laughs> oh, I've been enjoying this, this study in Matthew, though. Especially this chapter, Matthew chapter 10. Last week, we heard about... Um, Jesus sending out his disciples. And up until now, Jesus' instruction has included some, some really difficult commands, like sending you out like sheep among wolves, and some really somber prophecies. Verse 21, chapter 10 says, Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. Pretty brutal stuff, huh? Well, guess what? Today, you get to smile. Today, we've got some good news. We're going to start off in verse 26. It says, therefore, and we all know what we do when we see a therefore in Scripture. We have to say, okay, what is the therefore, therefore? It's to explain what came before and and explain that. So it says, okay, this was true, so then this. It says, therefore, do not be afraid of them. Be afraid of who? Well, them. <laughs> Isn't that quite often how it boils down is to us and them? Well, the them, if we look back in, in, in verse 16, said when he said, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves, well, it's the wolves. And to the people of Jesus' day, the wolves would have been like the Pharisees. In our day, those wolves are going to be false teachers, false prophets, anybody that's an enemy of God. That's they. <laughs> so don't be afraid of them. Easier said than done, huh? Because everything we see on the news tries to make us afraid of everything. Isn't that true? I mean, you, you just turn on the news and they try to keep that pot stirred up. The enemy's great at that. It says, don't be afraid of them since there is nothing covered that won't be uncovered and nothing hidden that won't be made known. Okay, well, that, that afraid word is the same word we get, um, that phobia. We have all kinds of phobias, don't we? Seems like people are afraid of everything. <laughs> but the phobia, um, he says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. And it is the wolves. And who are the wolves for us? We've determined it's those false prophets and teachers. So it says, nothing covered that won't be uncovered. Well, that's the physical part. That's the things that they don't want you to see, the things behind the scenes. All of those things are going to be uncovered so that as believers, we'll be able to spot them. And then what's the difference between the covered and the hidden? Well, the covered, like I said, is physical. The hidden is the secret stuff, the heart stuff, the stuff that they really don't want you to know. And so all of that's going to be made known to the believers so we don't have to be afraid. Fear just rules so many people's lives. Worry. I know I'm not the only one that some nights it's hard to turn this off. You just lie there worrying. Worrying about this. Worrying about that. What's going to happen tomorrow? And we spend so much time worrying and most of that stuff never happens. So verse 27 says, What I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. For those of you with a prayer closet or kneel beside your bed at night, I, I like it dark when I'm talking to God. It helps me to concentrate on what I'm doing. He says, what I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. So as I'm reading my, my scripture, as I'm listening for that still small voice that is sometimes so difficult to hear in, in amongst all the stuff we've got around us these days, 
We're to speak that in light. And what you hear in a whisper, proclaim on the housetops. I don't know about you, but sometimes God's voice isn't all that clear because of all the background noise. It's that still small voice that once we hear God's voice, once we look in his word and find out what he's already said, then we don't have to be afraid. It says proclaim. That means proclaim on the housetops. The, the proclamation is kind of like the heralding event of Jesus' birth. When the angels came and heralded that event from a mountaintop, that's how we're supposed to be with God's word is we're supposed to go up on the housetop and proclaim his word. And uh, we might get a little resistance, huh? <laughs> I know nobody here has ever experienced the resistance you get from trying to share the word. But we still have to do it with love and with respect. Verse 28 goes on to say, Don't fear those who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. And that's exactly what we face when we're facing our enemy out in the world. They can kill my body. It's not a thing they can do to my soul. It says, rather fear him who's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That'd be God. <laughs> but I would rather die serving Jesus than live serving myself in the world. We should have such a, a holy reverence for God that it overcomes our fear of the enemy. Fear actually defines how we view God. Any area of our life where fear is on the throne, guess what? God is not. So we've got to get fear off that throne and keep it there. See, I think a lot of the problem is as, as human beings, it's hard for us to look at things from God's eternal perspective. Because this is all we know is this, this timeline we're stuck in here. We don't have any point of reference for eternity at this point. We're born here and we have seconds and minutes and hours and days and weeks and months and years and somewhere over here we all die. So far the death rate's been 100% and not going to change anytime soon way it's looking <laughs> but where God is I best describe as having all time at one time and we can't wrap our heads around that but scripture says to God a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years a day which is another way of saying time is meaningless once we arrive So since this is all we can experience is this timeline we're stuck in, sometimes we go through things here that don't make sense. Sometimes we go through things we wish we didn't have to go through because it's hard to see how, how it fits into God's pure and perfect big picture because sometimes all we have is this little snapshot right here in front of us. For those of you that remember what a snapshot is, we have this little snapshot right here in front of us that sometimes this little snapshot gets really ugly. And so, yeah, it's hard to, to see. How does this possibly fit into that big, good picture? So often, as we're, as we're trying to figure that out, it gets overwhelming, doesn't it? But I think that if we would try to look at things more from God's perspective while we're here, and the best way to learn to do that is through his word and through the Holy Spirit that lives in you, is that we can try to look at things more from that eternal perspective. We don't, wouldn't be so worried. We wouldn't be so anxious or fearful of the things that, that in this world cause that anxiety. But we have to know God. The more we know God, the more we can find peace and contentment in an otherwise hectic world. Now, verse 29 says, aren't two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's consent. So he knows everything. He knew the two sparrows would fall. He allowed it. 
back then you could get two sparrows for a penny and sometimes they were hungry people and actually had to eat sparrows. I'm thinking like one bite, you know. <laughs> but anyway, verse 30, but even the hairs of your head have all been counted. Yeah, I, I can look around and there's a few of us that try to make it easier for him <laughs> to count those hairs. So don't be afraid. There it is again. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. God loves you so much more than he, the sparrows. It's his grace and his mercy that got you here this morning. And it's his grace and his mercy that'll see all of us home someday got to share with you a story. For those of you that don't know me, I'm, I'm a, my name's Jim. I'm a hospice chaplain. That's what I do. Um, most of you know what hospice is. We won't go into all that. But I had a patient one time named Woodrow Wilson. No, not that one. I'm not that old. Um, but seriously, his name was Woodrow. He went by Woody. And Woody was, was just a wonderful guy. He was on hospice, had cancer. And, and Woody had a big old toothy grin on him. Anytime you'd walk in the room, he'd just give you that toothy grin and, and everything would be okay. But Woody was an Old Testament theologian, knew his Bible inside and out. And so Woody and I had some really great discussions. But actually, Woody got better and had to come off of hospice services. So we had a graduation ceremony for him, gave him a diploma and sent him on his way. I said, great, cancer's in remission. Well, about a year later, I went in the office on a Monday morning and I get my patient list and Woody's name's back on there. And he and his wife, Bernadette, had, when I knew him before, he'd been in a high rise assisted living facility. They had to move to a skilled facility with a little higher level of care. So I stop by and I knock on the door and Bernadette opens the door and I walk in and there's Woody lying in a hospital bed. Looks kind of like a skeleton with skin on it. And Woody was just what we call in the dying process. And so in true fashion, I walked over, pulled a chair up to the head of the bed and I go, Woody, it's Chaplain Jim. And <laughs> Kind of startled him a little bit, but uh, he was able to, to talk a little bit, very weak. So we talked for about an hour and I had to leave and, and I said, Woody, I'll tell you what, I'll stop by later in the week and, and see how you're doing. So that Friday on my way home from work, I stopped to see Woody again. Walk in and Woody is just lying there in the dying process, unable to any longer open his eyes all the way. Could, could hardly breathe, let alone speak. But I get right in his ear and I go, Woody, it's Chaplain Jim. <laughs> and you could almost visibly see the spirit snap in his body. <laughs> and I said, I said, Woody, and I got right in his ear. I said, Woody, do you know what's going on? Woody said very softly, I'm dying. And I said, well, Woody, I'll tell you what, if you, if you want, I can have the nurse give you something more for pain if you're in pain, or, or if you're feeling a little anxious, I can have her give you something for that. And I tell you what, Woody was the most fearless man I ever met because what he told me has stuck with me all these years and did more for my own faith at that time than anything. And why I still repeat this story every chance I get might have been his last words, as so far as I know, but he whispered very softly, he said, I've waited for this all my life. I don't want to miss it. And is that not true faith? Is that not being fearless? Because as believers, we live our whole life waiting to see our Savior face to face. And sure enough, Woody went to be home with the Lord the next morning. But to me... Woody will always be one of my heroes. Um, you know how you get uh, devotionals over your phones once in a while? 
if you don't, see me afterwards and we'll make sure you do. I'm just going to read you part of one. My wife gets these over her phone. It's from uh, something called Susie Larson Blessings. May the reality of heaven mean more to you than your temporary circumstances on earth. May the promise of God's provision compel you to live generously and with expectancy. May you see the blessing in your battles, fierce as they are. Are you sturdier because of them? Do you have more compassion for those who suffer because of what you have experienced? Even in hardship, Jesus meets us refines us and empowers us to change the world. He loves to reward our faith. May you refuse to get tangled up in your regrets from yesterday, your frustrations today, and your fears about tomorrow. May you instead lift your eyes and look to Jesus. May you live with eternity in mind. Have a blessed day magnificent, eternally-minded day. If your Bibles are still open, Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, therefore, there's that word again, therefore, referring back to what Jesus has already instructed in light of what Jesus has already instructed. Therefore, everyone who will acknowledge me before others, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. The disciple must confess Jesus publicly. This Christian life that you and I are, are living is a public life. It is not a uh, private life. It's a public life. This call to live missionally, the call of Jesus to send out these disciples from town to town was very much a public call. Jesus says this, everyone who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge him. I will acknowledge him before my father. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny him before my Father in, in heaven. There should be an evidence in our lives, an evidence that we belong to him. What is the evidence? Would you consider the evidence in your life? In your life, what, do, what does the world know, uh, uh, see in you, hear in you, know of you, that you belong to, to, to him? The witness that you and I are called to live right here where he's planted us and, and then to the nations as he calls us. There's an evidence that we belong to, to him. Uh, we also, we dare mu not miss that Jesus here claimed that one's eternal destiny depended upon their response to him. Have you accepted or have you rejected? Verse 34 don't assume, Jesus says, don't assume that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. The message of Jesus as we reflect on the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7 of, of Matthew. It is indeed a message of, of peace. It is a message of peace. Yet, this message divides. Divides between those who choose it and those who reject it. The division between these two choices explains how Jesus did not come to bring peace, but he came with a, a sword. And that is an illustration of a dividing line, the dividing line between those who accept Jesus and those who reject him would even run through families. And I'm sure uh, if you're living, if you're breathing, if you're that witness that Jesus has called you to, there have been moments, even within your own families, people question why you do what you do. Uh, perhaps there's some conversations that 
uh, aren't entertained anymore. Or, or e- even, sadly, there's, there's families not gathering together like you once did. Uh, because there is this, this sword, <laughs> this, this message that divides people. Verse 37, the one who loves a father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Do you see this? More than me is not worthy of me. The one who loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me for the third time is not worthy of me. Verse 39, anyone who finds his life will lose it. And anyone who loses his life because of me will will find it. Jesus explained that the disciple must love and follow Jesus supremely. Jesus must come first. He must come first in your life. He must come first in my life. He must remain first in this church. He is the head of this church. Jesus must come first. You know, the greatest danger of idolatry comes not uh, not from uh, what is bad necessarily, but oftentimes from what is good. It's with the, with the good motives, right, that we do this. It's in the name of the Lord. Have you ever said that? I'm doing this in the name of the Lord. And, and oftentimes this is the, the conduct of our, of our lives. And so we get caught up in doing all these things that we miss the Lord Jesus as the number one priority. And, and somehow, somewhere along the lines, we begin doing all these things. And, and then we tend to this workspace theology. And, 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 we, and we've walked away from the grace that God has lavished upon us in Christ Jesus. I would, I would encourage you today to consider your life. I would implore you today to reevaluate who is sitting in that first seat. Is it the Lord Jesus or is it someone or something else? I would challenge you. Who is the number one priority in your life? Oftentimes, we have a miss miss priorities. And so we wonder why there's just not more clarity. Uh, Or we wonder why there's just so much chaos ensuing around us. If we go back to the priorities, is the Lord Jesus your number one? Uh, Are you married? Is your spouse your number two? Do you have children? Are they your number three? We go back to the biblical priorities. Church, we need to come back to the biblical priorities. But this is what happens when we lose sight of fearing God. All the priorities in our lives get out of whack. When we lose sight of his holiness, that no one comes close to him, that he's creator of all things, that in him we live and move and exist. We have our being only because of him. We lose sight of the fear of God. And I'm afraid that... The church has lost sight of the fear of God. And so no wonder we want to sing songs about me. And we want to be told how good I am. And in doing so, we've walked away from what we were created for. And it's relationship with the living God. I wonder, do you fear him? Have you lost sight of his holiness? Have you lost sight of the awe? Do you remember that first moment that it was so real? I mean, the, 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 the very uh, understanding that the moment if you were to stop taking a breath would be an eternity in a hell, but then Jesus reached out and rescued you. He redeemed you and he's transforming you. Oh, have we lost sight of what it was to be lost and then found? Church, may we come back to fearing God. He's holy. He's set apart. There's no one like him. And he's worthy. He's worthy. Verse 38, whoever 
doesn't take up his cross. Do you see this with me? And follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever doesn't take up his, his cross. When a person took a cross in Jesus' day, they took up the cross for one reason and one reason alone. They didn't take up the cross to, you know, to, to make art in their home. They, they, didn't, they didn't pick up the, the cross to, to just wear around their neck. No, when someone took the cross in Jesus' day, don't miss this. It was for one reason and one reason alone. It was to die. It's been said that the ancient Roman cross did not negotiate, did not compromise, and did not make deals. Matthew 27, verse 32, we see they forced him to carry his cross. Oh, let, this, let this image just burn within us. That our Savior, after the beatings, after the rest, after the mocking, after the spitting, after all of these, they put a cross, his own cross on his back. As he marched down the Via Della Rosa towards Golgotha. They forced him to carry his cross. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2. The, the author of Hebrews is writing to Jewish believers that have been scattered abroad. And this is what he says. Keeping our eyes on Jesus. What an encouragement for the church back then. And what an encouragement for the church today. How, we properly, how do we properly fear God? How will we keep him as number one priority? By keeping our eyes on Jesus. Not allowing the distractions of the world, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy, don't miss this, for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The, 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 the author of, of this text is reminding Jewish believers of what Jesus endured for us, what he endured for me, what he endured for you, and he gladly did it, because there was no other way Unto salvation, but through him. Luke chapter 14, verse 27 says, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Look back to verse 38, and whoever doesn't take up his cross, his cross, now your cross uh, isn't really your particular trial or, or trouble. By the way, the, the cross, once again, means death to self. But resurrection life unto God. Death to self and resurrection life unto God. Look to verse 40. The one who welcomes you welcomes me. And the one who welcomes me welcomes him who sent me. Anyone, verse 41, anyone who welcomes a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And anyone who welcomes a righteous person because he's righteous will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever, whoever, verse 42, gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is a disciple. Truly, I tell you, he will never lose his reward. Jesus closes the, the instructions before he sends them out. He closes the instructions referring to being welcomed and being a welcoming people. He closes the instructions by a single act of kindness illustrated in just a cup of cold water. Jesus says that anyone who receives the apostles... Believing their message about Jesus will also be receiving him and the one who sent him. In, ancient, in the ancient world, identity was tied to family and community. Identity, your identity was tied to your family and uh, the community in which you were brought up. It was understood that in showing hospitality, one welcomed not just an individual but the community who sent the person and all that they represent therefore welcoming a disciple of Jesus would mean receiving the very presence of Jesus himself and of the one who sent him God the father 
as Jesus closes these instructions, once again, he says, whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, one of these little ones, whoever shows this act of kindness, shows this hospitality, even to the little ones, little ones referring to apostles first and and then believers, because he is my disciple. Truly, I tell you, he will never lose his reward. Proverbs chapter three, verse seven says, don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Consider, and if you're just tuning in today, go back and maybe watch, certainly read the entire instructions from Jesus. The entirety of chapter 10. Jesus gives these instructions. The disciples need to hear the instructions before they're sent out. Thankful for the scripture in Proverbs because there are times in my life that, um, if I'm honest, man, I think I'm, I think I'm wise. And then that next thing happens, and I'm quickly reminded that I'm not as wise as I th- think I am. Isn't that the beauty? That we're all level at the foot of the cross. We're all in need of the grace of God. We're all in need of his wisdom. But this proverb reminds me that I'm not as wise as I think I am and that I must fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Turn away from any kind of idolatry. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place and in this online with us, those that are online with us, just for a moment. I wonder, is the Lord Jesus, could you be honest enough? Now, this is a private moment, (laughs) but it's soon to be public. Would you be honest enough in in this moment to consider the priorities of your life? Is the Lord Jesus your number one priority? If he's not, would you just, would you beg right now, God, help me. To walk away from anything or anyone that is not pushing me to live for you. Anyone or anything that's reducing you as number one priority, would you Would you reveal that to me right here in this moment? Would you reveal it to me? And would you have the courage to trust Almighty God in His unconditional love and His abundant grace and just say, Lord, I need you. Right now, I need you. I wonder if there's one here in the house or online that's never surrendered over to the Lord Jesus for salvation. As people are praying all across this place, I wonder if there's one here that would have the courage today to say, I, I have not accepted, I've, re, I've rejected this gift of salvation that you're talking about. But today, there's a stirring in my heart, a stirring in my life that I must say yes to Jesus. And I reach out and accept this gift of salvation today. If that's you, would you confess with your mouth? Would you say something like this? Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. And today, I repent of my sins and I trust you as Savior. And I receive today the greatest gift of salvation that was accomplished through the cross, burial, and resurrection. And starting today, I commit to following you all the days of my life. That's your prayer. Would you just thank him? 
for his grace? Would you thank him for salvation, saving you, forgiving you? Maybe there's one here today that's, you've lost sight of the fear of God. You've lost sight of the holiness of God. And today you just need to come back to that place. And make it a, and make it a daily discipline. The first thing when you wake up to say, thank you, God, for breathing life into my lungs today. I surrender over to your lordship of my life. Whatever you have for me this day, help me to fix my eyes on you and to live for your glory. Lord Jesus, we need your help. We can do nothing apart from you. So thank you. We praise you. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. We say amen.